Welcome, thank you for joining me in lecture 20, which is going to be about centripetal forces. Centripetal forces, you can probably tell from the name by now, it has to do with forces that keep things going in circles in the same way we talked about centripetal acceleration um, a number of lectures ago. So in this video, we're going to discuss, well, what are centripetal forces? Then I'm going to emphasize an important point about centripetal forces namely that they are not some kind of new interaction, but a role that any interaction can play. Um, in the process of all of this, we're going to review some um, other concepts from circular motion that we've met before, and we'll go through some examples and applications. So here's the first situation I want to look at uh, to analyze this, this idea. So imagine you're standing there and you're holding a string and you're swinging it around and there's a heavy ball attached to the end of the string. And the question we want to ask is, well, what force, if any, is needed to swing this ball in a circle, as shown? Now, is there a force needed? Well, yes. Why is that? Well, because Newton's first law tells us that if there's no force on the ball, then it would act, fly in a straight line at a constant, constant speed. But here it is constantly changing the direction it's going in, right? It's not going in a straight line. So yes, we'll need a force. Now, luckily, we've already done the necessary analysis um, in the previous lecture on centripetal accelerations. So if really you don't remember any of that, um, maybe pause this video, go back to the other video just to review that. But we know that the centripetal acceleration That's the acceleration of something going in a circle or going along part of a circle, AC, that was given by V squared over R, right? And it points towards the center of the, um, of the circle, right? So in this case, towards um, the hand. Now, We've derived this from the geometry of the motion. So I'm not going to derive it again. But because this is the acceleration, that means there has to be a net force. The net force is the mass of the thing going in a circle times the, times the, um, the centripetal acceleration. So mathematically, I can write this as mv squared over r and again towards the center center of the circle, right? So it's telling us there has to be a force on the ball acting towards the center of the circle that the ball is meant to go along. And of course here you can see what force is this. It's a tension of the string, right? If there's no tension in the string, then the ball will just go in a straight line. So here, in our example, this is the tension Of the string. Right? So the point here is, and I want to emphasize, is that the centripetal force, right, is not some new kind of interaction. It's not in this, it's not like there's tension and there's gravity and there are normal forces and then there are centripetal forces. No. Centripetal force is a role a force plays. Anytime a force is responsible, for making something go in a circle, that force takes on a, the role of the centripetal force. It could, of course, be a combination of forces that does it. And we'll look at an example of that a little bit down the line. So, so note, centripetal force is a role that a force plays. Not some new interaction. So any force in theory could act as a centripetal force. Um, could be, let's think of some examples. Um, if the moon goes around the earth in a big circle, well, it's the gravitational pull on the moon by the Earth. 
the car goes around the turn in the road, well, it's going to be the friction between the tires and the ground. So their static friction actually is responsible as to static friction plays the role of the centripetal force. And it's static because there's no sliding, right? The the wheel just touches down and goes back up. No point of the wheel is sliding um, along the road. In the case we were just looking at with the string, well, it's the tension in the string. And we'll look at other examples um, a little bit down the line too. It's important, so when you draw a free body diagram, right, never draw the tension and, you know, the weight and all those and the centripetal force. No, the forces that you have, those might work together to act as a centripetal force. That's an important point um, to emphasize here. Okay, let's actually put it into action. Let's take this example. Let's plug in some numbers. Um, let's say, let's say we're going to go with the following values, just to be concrete. Say the mass of the ball is um, 200 grams. The the radius of the um, of the circle, so the length of the string really is 80 centimeters. In the picture, I've already drawn it a bit longer, that's okay. Um, and then let's say we know the time around and say that's half a second. So, what I'm saying is this remember is the period, period that's the time once all the way around. Hopefully you remember the concept. So the question is then, what is the tension in the string? Right, that's what we're asking. So let's apply what we just learned. Well, the tension acts as the centripetal force. How do I know that? Well, just imagine you cut the string. Tension goes to zero, the ball is no longer going in a circle. So you can just do this kind of thought experiments sometimes to figure out, well, what is the force responsible here? But you have to look at the physical situation and determine what's going on, right? There's no sort of hard and fast rule that tells you, um, you know, if mass greater than five kilograms, the force is X. And it doesn't make any sense, right? You have to look at what's going on, and use your understanding of the physics to, to see what force is responsible. Do little thought experiments. What if I cut the string? What if I replace the road with a sheet of ice? Is the car still going to go in a circle? Maybe not. Okay. Must be friction, right? So that's how you can often um, play little thought games to figure out what's the, what's the relevant force, what's the relevant interaction. The tension actor is a centripetal force. So T is, I might write it like this, FC for centripetal. It's going to be MV squared over R. Now, what is V? Of course, because we're going in a circle, distance traveled over time taken, 2 pi R over T over the period, distance around, time around, right? Hopefully you remember that part. If you plug in those values that I've got up here, um, v would be 2 pi times 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.5, which is in meters. It's in second. Notice I converted to meters so we can have everything in meters per second. Um, and now, if I'm not mistaken, you plug in those values and you're going to end up with what I believe is just over, oops, you can't see this, just over. 10 meters per second. Right, so twice around per second, it's, it's fairly, um, fairly fast, I suppose. So then we can plug this in. So we're going to get that the tension is equal to m, which is um, 200 grams, 0 0.2 kilograms, times v squared, 10, 0, 5, meters per second squared, now it's just going the whole thing, including the units, divided by the radius, um, radius was 80 centimeters, 0 0.8 meters. 
plug all this in and we're going to end up i think with about 25 slightly over 25 newtons 25.25 newtons Sorry. again you should double check it with your um with your own calculator or just you know practice some some arithmetic in your head why not okay so 25.25 newtons and we're done now i've ignored in this question in this problem i've ignored the weight of the, of the ball like what about what about the weight i mean the weight acts down right what's holding the ball up like what is stopping this ball if there's tension to the left a weight down well tension to the left is making it turn but should it also start going downwards because nothing is balancing out the weight that is true that should indeed happen so realistically you won't be able to have the string be perfectly horizontal well the weight how big is it mg would be 0 0.2 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared which is um, 2 newtons so we sort of were justified in kind of ignoring it like this is way bigger than the weight right so the impact of the weight is going to be comparatively small it's less than a 12 um, of the tension but realistically what we would have um, realistically what you have is that the string uh, might actually look something like this. So here's my hand, um, hand. Here's my ball. Something like this. But there's there's some angle here. Let's call it theta, because then the tension. Uh, let, me, let me use different colors. Let me use the, the weight acts down. Weight acts down tension acts in the direction of the string and then what happens is that the tension has a has, has a vertical component right? the vertical component is going to cancel out the weight and it has a horizontal component the horizontal component is going to create the net force inwards towards the center of the circle the center of the circle of course being a little bit below the hand so hopefully you can visualize the swinging a ball like that where there's an angle, the, the string is angled downwards a bit. And that's a fun little calculation to do. Um, of course, the net force, let me just write like this, net force is going to be this. It's a fun little calculation to do to figure out, for example, if I want theta to be 30 degrees for the given setup that we talked about, um, how fast do I have to swing it? So with all the same values, except except a different period, perhaps. Um, you now you figure out um, how fast you have to swing it to get get thirty degrees here. So how fast? And we can talk about this in class. How fast do you need to swing the the ball or string to have theta equals 30 degrees or just any any value right um, now I just noticed I may I did something very confusing which I now regret which I did not notice before what I did is what I called the period T and I also called it tension T now hopefully you noticed this right so this was a terrible thing like this makes no sense at all if you are confused that is totally fine so let me replace the tension uh, because I called a period 0.5. I should really call the tension maybe F T force of tension, and then this is also the force of tension. Don't know how I didn't notice this before. Um, makes it it's glaringly confusing, right? But hopefully the derivation is very short. We'll be able to um, with that cleared up, make sense of it all. So just take a moment. To just go through that to make sure it all makes sense. All right, let's look at some other examples of um, centripetal forces. Here's the next example. We want to estimate the gravitational force on the Earth due to the Sun. 
happen to the Earth is going in a big circle around the Sun. And the data we're given, or you can look this up, of course, in your textbook or online. Um, the mass of the Earth is about 6 times 124 kilograms. And the distance between the Sun, or sorry, the center of the Sun and the Earth, is 150 million kilometers. Now, we're going to be rough, we're just going to estimate, do an estimate. Now, you could do this calculation, find the force, by understanding how gravity works. And knowing the mass of the Sun and the mass of the Earth, you'd be able to calculate it that way. And indeed, we're going to do that later on in the course. But let's suppose we don't know how gravity works. But we do understand centripetal force, centripetal acceleration, and let's say we do understand, we know what the mass of the Earth is, and we've measured the distance to the Sun. So, it feels like this isn't much information, but of course there's more we know. We know the period. Period T is one year. Right? That's how long it takes for the Earth to go around the Sun. Now, there's the whole sidereal and solar year and what, never mind that, right? It's one year. Well, how long is a year? Well, I want to convert it into seconds. So I'm going to multiply it by the number of days, and that's 365.25, 65 and a quarter, 0.24 maybe, um, times uh, how many hours in a day? 24 times 60 minutes in an hour times 60 seconds. Not that many seconds. Now, you can actually do this, of course, but here's a trick. And the trick is, I mean, not that this is hard, but, but the trick is, the trick to remember the answer, because it might comes up occasionally, what's a year in seconds, is that this is approximately pi times 10 to the 7 seconds. That is pure coincidence. There is no, no conspiracy here. If you go online, you probably find some conspiracy communities that do see some kind of deeper reason for this, but now it's all nonsense. Um, it, it just had numbers just happen to work out that way, right? If the Earth was a little bit closer to the Sun, a little bit further, it wouldn't work out that way. But to about two significant figures, um, one year is pi times 10 to 7 seconds. It's easy to remember. Maybe it's a nice little party trick. You know, what's a year in seconds? I can calculate in my head. Um, it's, it's pi times 10 to the 7. All right, that said, of all conspiracies that might be out there, it's probably a fairly harmless one if you think there's, there's some deeper reason for this. No, it's just a numerical coincidence. Um, but let's go with it. We'll just ask to do an estimate, right? So that is going to be good enough for us. So we want to find the... Um, centripetal force because we identify hey that this gravitational force that is what acts as centripetal force maybe we should make a note of that gravitational force that plays the role of the centripetal force right because i don't see any strings attached to the earth that the tied to the sun. I don't see any thrusters that sort of keep it on its in its orbit. Um, not sure what else there, what else you can come up with, how the Earth might be going in a circle in ways other than gravity, right? No, it's the gravitational pull that keeps the Earth going in a circle and stops it from flying out into space in a straight line. So you want to find the, um, the centripetal force. That is the force of gravity. So we first need the speed of the Earth. Maybe we've done a calculation before. Well, the speed of the Earth is going to be 2 pi r divided by the period. Right? The distance traveled in one year divided by year. That gives me the distance traveled per year. I can convert it to meters per second. Now, if I plug in the numbers I've got, that's 2 pi times 1.5, I'm going to use this number here, times 10 to the 8 kilometers or 10 to the 11 meters when I convert it. And then I divide by the period. The period is happens to be this, right? Remember, pure coincidence that there's a pi here. There's nothing to do with circles. It just happens to numerically be roughly 31 million. Um, so, we can 
we can then simplify this and what you should find is that that's going to be um, 30,000 excuse me meters per second or about 30 kilometers per second right now that is fast 30 kilometers a second that's how fast we are we're whizzing around the sun um, of course the sun itself is moving through the through the galaxy at a speed that's something like 200 or 250 kilometers per second um, so it really depends on what's your frame of reference right how fast is it that you're going but relative to the sun if the sun defines our frame of reference our notion of rest we're going 30 kilometers per second in a big circle so now we can figure out what these these centripetal forces it's the mass of the earth times the speed of the earth squared divided by r that same radius right with that's the radius for a circle um, now you plug in those numbers and you take care of those all those powers of 10 you've got to be pretty careful here let's make sure you you, you know you practice multiplying powers of 10 the trick is let me write it out for you 6 times 10 to 24 the trick not to make mistakes now i'm writing this also 30,000 as is this let's get squared divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 11. Um, one trick is that you you take care of the sort of numerical values those factors those prefactors separately and the powers of 10 separately so I might write this as 6 times 3 squared divided by 1.5. And then I multiply it by 10 to the 24 times 10 to the 8, 10 to the 4 squared um, divided by 10 to the 11. I mean, it doesn't do anything mathematically, but it helps me as a human being avoid mistakes, especially when I'm punching numbers into a calculator. Now, actually, you can see that you might not even need a calculator um, in this case. Um, and and so we can straightforwardly um, work this out. So this is going to be um, 6 times 9 is 54, divided by 1.5. How divided by 1.5? Divided by 3, multiplied by 2. So that is 36. 36 times 10 to the 24, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 8, it's 10 to the 32, divided by 10 to the 11. That's 10 to the 21. Um, so that is this. So that I guess I should write this then as 3.6 times 10 to the 22 to bring it into proper scientific notation, where the where it's you know just a single digit before the um, the dot. 3.6. Right. That's just a sun. This of course is also correct. They're the same values. It's different ways of writing it. But this is what you call standard scientific notation, um, and that many, that many newtons, which is a large number of newtons, right? Ten to twenty-two. I'm sure you write it out. Let's do it at least once. Um, it's going to be three, six. We need to put twenty-one zeros after this. I think it's the right number. That many newtons. That's a lot of newtons. All right, let's do another example. The next example I want to look at is one of a roller coaster. So imagine in the middle of a roller coaster ride, you've gone over some hills, maybe around some loop de loops. Now you're just going over this hill right here, and we're looking at you when you're right at the top there, right, right at the top of the hill. Now. The hill we imagine is has a radius of 10 meters. What does that mean? It means that at the very top of the hill, I can essentially approximate the shape of it by a by a circle of radius 10 meters. Right? Of course, when you're coming up here, it's flat, so it's not actually a circle. But maybe between here and here, you can imagine this sort of arc be the arc of a circle of radius 10 meters. Okay. Now, we are asked, well, how heavy do you feel right at the top? Now, if you've been on a roller coaster ride before, you know, okay, you sort of feel heavy and light in different places. And given our, um, given what you know about, say, elevator rides, you can kind of, you probably have a sense of how, how to think about that. Um, so let's make this explicit. How heavy do you feel if you're going 8 meters per second at the top of the hill? Right, how fast are you going matters, of course. 
Well, what forces are acting on you right there? Let's draw a free body diagram. So I'm just going to add the force. Actually, no, I'm going to draw a free body diagram. I'm not going to make the diagram unnecessarily messy. So, of course, you have your weight, right? And it's your mass um, times g. And then there's a normal force. Now, are those two equal? Well, you are currently changing direction. So you were going up, and now you're going down. So not necessarily. In fact, because you were you were going up and now you're starting to go down, it means you're turning downwards. So you can hopefully already see that we need to have a downwards net force at this point. It implies the normal force there is a little bit less than, than the weight. Let's figure out how much less in a second. So one thing we have to remember is, well, what does it mean to ask how heavy do you feel? That this question, how did we answer it before? That is to say, we want to find the normal force. Because remember, what you feel is not the weight itself or gravity itself. What you feel is the internal normal forces in your body that gives you your sense of weight. When you feel light or heavy, because you're in free fall, because you're in an elevator, or because you're on a roller coaster, that is because the normal forces have changed. I want to find the normal force. Um, Fn, like I've called it here. Right, so what do we have? We have a net force, F net. It's going to be downwards, and it's equal to mg minus Fn. And that force, that net force, makes you turn, right? The net force determines your acceleration. The acceleration to keep going in this circle, like this, part like this vertical circle, um, that better be equal to your mass times v squared over r. Right. So what does that imply? That implies then that the normal force is going to be equal to um, m, so let me take the normal force to the other side, I'm going to take this to the left. And have g minus v squared over r. So again, make sure you, you, know, you follow the algebra. So if the two steps um, in one go there, take this over, take this left, and then factorize. I guess that's three steps. Um, now what is that? I can plug in values, right? This is, I don't know what my mass is, because if, say, if I'm the... Um, roller coaster engineer who built this thing, then I, you know, riders will have different masses. Different people will go on the roller coaster. So there's no specific value there. But then this is going to be 10 meters per second squared because we're designing this this to work on Earth. Uh, minus now V squared was 8 meters per second squared divided by R. R is 10 meters, right? R is the radius of this, this vertical circle. The speed is 8 meters per second. Um, now, this is 64 over 10, 6.4. So we're going to end up with m times 10 minus 6.4. That's 3.6 um, meters per second squared. Now, here I've got m for mass, but also for meters per second squared. Kind of annoying. Um, so, you know, you know that these are the units. I think that's clear enough. So that means this is how heavy you feel, right? This is your perceived weight. Um, not sure why I kept going in red there. But this is your perceived weight. Right? Normally, normally it's it's mg, but mg is ten here. It's only m times 3.6. So it's about slightly greater than one third of your um, normal weight, normal perceived weight, right? So you feel only about a third as, as heavy because this is 3.6, not 10. M times G would be how heavy you normally feel. But this is not M times G, M times 10. This is your mass times 3.6, which is a little bit more than a third of 10. Um, it's also, incidentally, um, very close to 
your weight on Mars, but which is has G Mars 3.7. Let's just, you know, fun fact, I guess. Right, so hopefully th th this makes sense. Here I notice the centripetal force that makes us go in a circle vertically here was made up of a combination of those two. Right, their combination, the net force we get from those two, that is what's equal to the expression for the centripetal force because those two together end up creating a downwards, overall downwards pull. That's what's making you turn. Okay, so here are some, some follow-up questions um, we can do. If you, if you want to go in a loop-the-loop, -loop, and maybe in the same roller coaster, we have a loop-the-loop -loop of radius r, You can plug in a value or you can just, you know, decide on your own radius and um, just leave it symbolic. Maybe I should call it capital R to distinguish it from the, the little r of the previous problem. Um, how fast do you need to go at the top to not fall? Now, because you're probably strapped in in a realistic roller coaster, you're not going to fall anyway, right? You're going to be just hanging there uncomfortably if the roller coaster suddenly stops up at the top of your loop the loop, right? So here you go, loop the loop. Right, you're stuck up here. Oh no. Um, but assuming you're moving, right, how fast do you have to move so you don't feel like you're actually falling out of your. Um, out of your out of your cart. Well, a similar question we can ask. It's kind of mathematically identical. Is imagine you have a bucket with a um, with a string attached, and you fill the bucket with more with water. Mathematically identical problem. So we imagine I have I have some kind of bucket here is here I am and I'm holding a string and on the end of the string there's a there's a bucket and in the bucket in the bucket there's um, there's a bunch of water. And I want to swing this bucket all the way around over my head. Right? How fast do I have to swing it so that the water doesn't come out? That's a fun problem to think about. It's a problem we can also talk about in class. Now, I want to give you a hint. The hint is that at the top, and the hint applies both to you and the roller coaster as well as the water in the bucket, right? It's the same, same problem. Um, the hint is that at the top, what forces are acting? Well, there's your weight, mg, and it's also a normal force, right? A normal force either from the um, from the, the, the cart or from the tracks on you or on the cart, depending what the system is, or the normal force from the, the bottom of the bucket on the water, or if you treat a bucket as a whole as the system, then there's tension from the string on the bucket. So there's another force down, but it's crucial to notice that this force is down as well, right? The normal force in the roller coaster case is down when you're, and you're upside down. So this would be the normal force. Or tension in the case of the, in the case of the bucket, right? So different forces, but mathematically it's the same kind of setup. And so they together create a downwards net force that's going to be equal to the, um, to the centripetal force. Now the key to figuring out what's the slowest I can go is that the normal force or the tension, they will adapt. Right? If you swing it faster, they're going to get bigger to compensate. 
But if you keep going slower and slower and slower, these ones will get smaller and smaller and smaller. This one will stay constant. So what does that mean? It means eventually you reach a point where those ones have gone to zero. There's essentially no tension in a string when you're right at the top. There is no normal force from the track on the card or from the card on you when you're right at the top. And that's okay because it's your weight that keeps you going in the right direction on the, along the right trajectory. But if you were going any slower than that, then, well, the weight wouldn't compensate. The normal force of tension, they can't be negative. And that's when you'd start falling. So, at a, so for the minimum speed, for either of those two problems, I'm solving both at once because they have the same sort of mathematics. Different forces, maybe, but the same mathematics. Minimum speed implies that the normal force or tension, depending on what the problem is, is zero. You know, leave it at that. You can solve it from there, and we can fill in the missing pieces in class. Okay, so that was the last part of this lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you in class, and please, please, please do think about those questions so we can talk about them and we can clarify any misunderstandings that you have. I'll see you in class or the next lecture.